my name is Brian Hubbs. Uh, thanks everybody for, for coming today. Um, just to introduce myself, I, I'm the H and RDH. I started this company with a couple of my friends uh, about 22 years ago now, 23 years ago, I can't remember. And, in, and I can honestly say that when we started this company, we never dreamed that it would come to this, where we can put on an event like this. So um, I'm just super excited to be here and, and thank you, Bailey, for putting this on um, and, and organizing this. This is something I, I never thought I'd see RDH do uh, at this scale. So, um, so we're bringing together a whole bunch of things. And uh, I don't know too many, if, if everybody here knows the, 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 the sort of genesis of RDH, but we really started as a company that fixed buildings that, that leaked because of the leaky condo crisis, either in, up in Vancouver and then we got involved with buildings in Seattle and Portland that were really having problems because of a particular issue, i.e. You know, water got in and made things bad. Right? That was our model for many years. And it really was a result of a confluence of other drivers that, that came together at a, at a certain time and made things bad. And that was you know, primarily some small changes in the, in the industry. right? Energy uh, was an issue. We started putting vapor barriers in walls and increasing the R value and using products in a much more complicated manner. Uh, if you look at a simple little building from the 50s, you know, it's uh, lots of wall, a few, few punch windows, that's about it, maybe some balconies. So we started to put these together in much more complicated ways. And we're trying to meet much higher energy targets. We're trying to put more building in the same amount of physical space, right? Because the density is going up. Um, and we're trying to make them faster, and, uh, and so we don't necessarily build when it's, when it's dry and nice out. We build all the time. So all those things come together. They make a leaky condo crisis. We start RDH, we deal with it, and then we start to help people build buildings that don't have problems. And that's where I come in. That's what my, where I live these days. I help people build buildings that don't have issues. And now I see this, and the, the confluence of drivers that we have now is an order of magnitude greater than what we had in the days when we had a leaky condo crisis. The days leading up to the leaky condo crisis, we had some small changes. And now we're making much bigger changes and we're really reinventing a lot of the ways that we're going to approach building enclosures and adding this wood element to, you know, this tall wood element and this mass timber element to it also increases that risk. So I'm super excited about moving forward and it really makes me wake up in the morning and run to work because I get to do and, and invent new things and get involved with cool projects. <clears throat> but at the same time, we all have to be cognizant of the fact that our last leaky condo crisis, our last leaky building crisis was created by a much smaller change in our industry. We're better prepared for it now, we have better computer systems and better models and better materials and everybody's cognizant of it, but we got to work together to make it work. And that's why I'm here, because, you know, people are, are making it work, uh, other people aren't. We're still getting involved in issues that people have on their, their projects and, and they hire us to come fix them, still. Um, because of these added complications. So let me tell you some stories. Um, why are we doing this, right? Uh, our energy codes are changing, right? We want to reduce carbon. We want to make our buildings much more energy efficient. Does that sound familiar, right? Um, we want to use more renewable resources, so mass timber structures. We're building things that are much more um, intolerant of moisture. Uh, Colin got into that. Graham's going to get into it in a lot of detail. <clears throat> and, and so this is pushing us to the prefabrication element, to make things off the site. Because we all know when we make something on site, you know, Ford would never make a vehicle on a construction site, right? Because it wouldn't work. Um, so, you know, so we're taking that sort of knowledge and building as much as we can in a factory where we have controlled environments and trained workers and less distraction and bringing them to site and, and doing the absolute minimum amount of work on site. <clears throat> so when we talk about integrating mass timber into our building enclosures, there's a lot of good reasons to do it, um, not the least of which is the beauty of it. Just look around this particular space here, I, I just, I love the exposed wood. Um, you know, so we're, we're incorporating it into, into above grade walls, roofs, we want to leave it exposed if we can to show the function. You know, as an engineer, I like to see the, the structural system in the building. Uh, as an architect, you might want to, you know, the, the, just adds a lot of warmth. So leaving it exposed is great, you know, that's the, that's the desire. Uh, we got to protect it from moisture during construction. We got to deal with heat, moisture, air, all the normal things that, that I have to deal with, even without being a wood, a wood timber building. Um, structural loads, Colin talked about those. 
and whether or not it's structurally load bearing. So, um, you know, what makes mass timber buildings uh, unique? Um, it's really just the use of wood as the structure and then as the interior finish and that combination, right? Uh, there's a lot of new structural connections. Colin went into those. We use hybrids of steel and wood, um, longer and heightened exposure during, during construction, uh, and it's just not the same as stick-built mid-rise. You can't do the same thing, because that, that, as Colin mentioned, the structure holds moisture, doesn't dry fast. If it gets wet during construction, it could cause quite a lot of issues afterwards. Right? <clears throat> the neat thing, so years ago, this is a, um, a building that I worked on called Brock Commons at UBC. And uh, this was my first really tall wood building. It's actually the tallest wood building in the world for a while. I think it's not anymore. Um, 18 stories high. And I got involved with it. Um, and, it and it was my first you know, really tall building. So you know, some of the things that, uh, that came out of this pretty quick is that, wow, you can, make, you can erect these things pretty quick. Uh, but they're super sensitive to moisture. We did a lot of work trying to uh, balance the moisture, the fire, uh, and that combination of mixing wood and steel and concrete together to make this building work. All right, <clears throat> one of the things you need, to, you need to think about first when you're building a mass timber building is what the enclosure structure is, what, what, the, what the structure is of the, of the building itself, right? You've got post and beam with interior shear walls, post and beam with core shear walls, and solid wood and, and floor panels. Right? Depending on which system you're using, you're going to have a different envelope system. Right? In some cases where you have solid wood and floor panels, your wall system is your structure. It's holding your building up. In other cases, with your post and plate and, and some of your post and beams, your, your enclosure is going to be hung off that. And it's not going to be supporting the building. The building's going to be supporting the enclosure. Um, and so there's some real you know, simple decisions you make early on in the game where you have to decide how you're going to do your enclosure. Interestingly enough, uh, Colin had some pictures of this, this solid wooden floor panel building, uh, and there was snow on the ground. And I thought, good, you know, at least if you build this in the winter when it's snowing, you've got a chance of building it while it's, while it's tight, uh, while it's not getting wet. If you built it out here in the fall, um, that's going to get so wet during construction that uh, you won't even be able to stick that membrane on it. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. So the need for speed. This is the biggest thing when you build a tall wood building. Um, you want to erect and seal your enclosure as fast as you can. Uh, you want to try and fabricate as much as you can off site. And you need to be accommodating of inclement weather. Right? You need to use robust materials, be more tolerant of movement. Uh, has to be obviously thermally efficient these days and uh, relatively non-combustible or at least meet uh, the fire code in the area you're building it. <clears throat> There's two different kinds of tall buildings. There's the tall, slender, tall wood building, or high-rise wood structure, like Brock Commons. Um, and then there's the low-rise structure, um, which, you know, it's a large building, but there's less height to it. Uh, what I find when you're trying to pick which envelope system to use, it will be highly dependent on the shape of your building. So this tall building, right, you're not going to be able to reach the top of that building with man lifts. So, you're, you know, there's a bunch of construction methods you're not going to be able to use. If you're thinking about putting membrane on from the outside and cladding everything, once you've built the building, it's not going to be a really cost-effective or schedule-effective way to do that, uh, unless you kind of scaffold the whole building, which also increases your cost. Low-rise structure you can access with cranes and things from the ground. So there you might be able to do it. You have lots of cranes working on lots of areas at, at once and getting everything up as quick as you can. So these are some of the, the you know, facade systems we've utilized for mass timber buildings, right? You've different uh, interior and exterior systems, but you're usually looking at some form of, of uh, structural wall, be it wood or studs, or even concrete, with exterior insulation and some, some cladding. These are all different variations of Claddings we've used on mass timber buildings. And you don't have to have a timber cladding on a mass timber building. You can have a, a precast concrete sandwich panel. Right? You can have curtain wall. You can have passive house CLT wall installed like curtain wall. We'll get into those in more detail. Um, Graham's going to talk a lot about this. 
got to keep it warm and dry. Here's some examples here of what happens when you take really good looking um, dry stuff and you let it get wet in the rain, right? It does what all wood does and it checks and it starts to come apart. One thing we noticed when we started working with uh, North American CLT is that it's not always side glued. So we did a bunch of testing of European CLT where it was side glued. It didn't, didn't do this anywhere near as much. When we started to test the North American products, uh, some of them checked and, and fell apart, like physically fell apart fairly quickly when we exposed to water because it wasn't side glued and that water got in the side. And some of the North American product just has adhesive on the, the top bottom and on the sides. It still works structurally, but when it gets exposed to water, water can get in there and then it can stay in there longer and it can create this kind of an issue. So where you put the insulation matters, right? And what we find is often uh, best, your best wall has got all the insulation on the outside if you can do it. That's not always going to be possible these days because when you move to passive house levels, you're going to have to probably put some on the inside as well. But if the intent's to keep the CLT, if you're building a CLT wall, then you want to have all the insulation outboard. And we've done that, and that seems to be the best, most cost-effective way to do it. So here's an example of a mass wood building. It's being built and being clad from the exterior off of uh, vertical uh, hoists. Uh, it can be done. Um, any chance that could be done in Seattle like this? This is being done in Quebec where in the winter. Um, they're making it work, but if we built this in Seattle or Vancouver, if we didn't finish it in August, we'd be in trouble, right? This would get wet and you'd have a hard time getting that adhesive membrane to even stick on it. And then even if you did, you'd have moisture in there you're building in. <clears throat> Plus it would take a, quite a lot of time to, to, to actually build this on the outside of the building, so you'd have a lot of building exposed for a long period of time. This is what I was talking about earlier. With a, with a mass wall, you can have the CLT panels, if you're using mass wood in your, in your enclosure, they can support the building or they can be hung off the building as, as curtain wall units or facade units. And that depends entirely on your structure. Do you, are you using your wall CLT as a support for your slabs or are you hanging it off the slabs? All important considerations. <clears throat> Roofs, exterior insulated versus conventional. You know, you can, you can still do your roofs this, the same way. The only problem, the only, the only increased risk that we find is I think you want to bring your roof panels in with a membrane on them already, and then that should be part of your waterproofing membrane. So either that's your vapor barrier for your conventional roof, or it's your waterproofing membrane if you're using an inverted roof. And these little spaces, these little cavities to create slope, um, we've had a lot of issues on buildings where water's gotten in that cavity, and then it's very, very difficult to dry it out. So, uh, so we tend to say if we're going to go inverted, we're going to tilt the CLT or have sloped CLT and not build in spaces where water can get in. Okay, so why prefabrication? This is uh, where we switch to case studies, which is my favorite way of presenting information. So this is, the, this is my first tall wood building, my first high-rise wood building that I was involved with. Um, and the owner came to me, the owner's a good friend of mine, he came to me and he said, Brian, you need to build this building, and it's 18 stories high, it's made out of wood. Uh, I don't really care what the enclosure's made out of, um, but the enclosure's what's going to make or break this. So we've got to build it fast, we've got to get, it's a university student residence, we've got to get people in it in the fall. And we're talking about, you know, a year before, talking about building this. We've got to build this thing in a year, get kids in it. <clears throat> so we start to think about it, and... Um, these are the criteria he gives me in a meeting. So in a meeting full of other consultants, the architect's there, and he says, here's what I want. Brian, I want fast installation. I want a floor a day. You know, I want to be able to install the enclosure one floor in one day, eight hours per day. That's all the crane time you're getting, right? And it's got to be watertight once you install it, and it's got to be right underneath where we're putting the structural slab. I'm not paying for scaffolding, and I'm not paying for man lifts. This is a tall, slender building, so figure out how to do it without me having to pay a million dollars for scaffolding or vertical lifts. I also don't want to ever go on the outside. I don't want to go on the outside ever. I don't want to have to cock this thing. I want it to be watertight once I put that panel in. I want it to be resistant to water. I want to be able to install it in the rain, just in case it is raining. I want pre-installed cladding. 
and I want pre-installed windows, so I don't ever want to go on the outside to put cladding in or put windows in. It's a hell of a wish list, right? We're all, we're all people working in the industry. This isn't, this isn't done every day. I want it durable. I want it high performance. I want it thermally efficient. So I need, a, I need an effective R16. It's not passive house, but that's, that's pretty good for an effective number. Oh, I also want it inexpensive, so it's got to be less than $50 a square foot when we're finished and installed. And I said, well, why don't we put another, like, bubble there that says, we all get to retire after this job, because this is a pipe dream. And, uh, but he made it pretty clear. If the envelope couldn't do this, the building didn't make sense as a wood building, and it wasn't going to get built as a wood building. It was going to get built as a concrete residence. They, they know how much those things cost. They've got that all figured out. So this wasn't going to go ahead as a tall wood building unless we could get, make the envelope work. So I said, okay. I'm going to put together, you know, nobody makes this. We can't just go buy it. We can't just go price it. So what we've got to do is figure out, you know, something that might work, pitch it to somebody that, that might make it, um, figure out that, it, you know, test that it works, and then, and then get it on our building, and, and, you know, hopefully that'll be less than $50 a square foot. <clears throat> so as part of this training, um, my client, who's, who's a great guy, he hired... Um, Herman Kaufman, and he's an architect that had, had previously designed the tallest wood frame building in the world. Um, <clears throat> and this is, he hired, you know, we hired him to help us figure out how to do this enclosure and how to build the, the main structure. And this was the video that I was shown in the first meeting. So Brian, here, sit down, relax. This is how it's done. I'm going to go back and show it again. All right. Day one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. He built a building in eight days. This is when it clicked. I watched this video and it clicked. Okay, tall wood building has a real reason to, to exist, right? We can build a building in eight days. That's something that's very attractive in our, in our crazy construction climate, right? Where we, we need to build fast. Because schedule is often the more expensive part of your, of your construction. It took five workers eight days to build this building. And I'm blown away. And we're all just, you know, we're all flabbergasted. I can't believe it. But the video that he showed just had a little bit of scaff net starting at the bottom. So I put my hand on it. I said, wait a minute. What's the scaff net for? And why is there scaffolding on that building? You know, got to put the enclosure on. Like, we have to put the cladding on. This is just the building. We just built the structure and we made it watertight so that we could, we could finish it. And so they've built scaffolding. They built the structure. And now he says... Well, now you've got to put the cladding on. So watch this. Eight, remember, eight days to build a building. Okay? There's a roof on it. They put a roof on this, on this scaffold, so now it's completely dry, and it snows. So I solved Graham's problem. Graham doesn't even need to talk anymore. Just make your building in eight days. Look for a, a break in the weather for eight days, so where it's not going to rain or snow, and then just build your building, right? And this is what, you know, what he was saying is just, it's great. It's so fast, you just wait till you have good weather and build it. Like, great. If that's, our, if that's our only solution, this is, this is sweet. But here's the rest of the video. So I got the rest of the video from, because I'm more interested in cladding than I am in the base structure. And here we watch it. Now, keep an eye on that tree. There's a little tree here. And notice it doesn't have any leaves on it. Okay? Watch. Okay, so it snows, but it's okay. They got a roof. The scaff net goes up. It's completely protected from moisture. No, there's, there's leaves on the trees, full summer, it's clouds, sun, leaves are starting to fall off the trees by the time they're done. Okay, so that's, I said, how long did it take to put the enclosure on? And he said, oh, it took about uh, eight, eight, nine months to put the enclosure on, right? Hmm, what did it cost to put the enclosure on? And it was somewhere in the order of it converting from euros, it was about $150 a square foot to put the enclosure on, and you include the scaffolding and the schedule and the cost of everything. So you remember that my client wanted everything for 40 and the cladding alone was three times that price. Um, so we kind of, you know, it was like, thanks for your presentation. I get why we're building wood now, but we're going to have to figure out how to do the envelope ourselves because that's not going to work, right? That, that's clearly not going to work for my client. So we started to look around at our toolbox of enclosure elements, right? We have window wall, we have curtain wall, we have other things that we know we can, we can get a price for right away. And we know that if we price out window wall, um, we're probably going to be okay. I think we'll probably be in that $40 a square foot range just a couple years ago. Um, it's not like that anymore. 
Um, but the problem with window wall is it doesn't work from a schedule point. With window wall, you, you actually make a building in a, in a vertical assembly line. So you've got one slab where you're putting membrane on, the next slab you're, you know, one slab you're putting angle on, then the next slab down you're putting membrane on, then the next slab down you're putting windows in, then the next slab down you're caulking them in place. So it takes about five floors of a vertical assembly line to make this work. And generally you're doing about a floor a week, not a floor a day. So this, this is, we know we can make the cost work, we know there's people that can make this, but we know it's not going to work on our schedule, right? So we think, what about unitized curtain wall? We use this on a lot of projects, okay? Well, there's a couple problems with that. One is the R value doesn't work. Another one is that it's too slow. It's another, it's a, it's another one where it's about a floor a week that we usually budget. And also, um, hmm? Well, these are actually put on small cranes from the floor above, um, so that works. But it's too slow. We're going to have the whole building built, we'll still be on the first floor, putting curtain wall in. So the main thing is, it's not going to enclose our, our structure fast enough. Oh yeah, also, it's twice our budget, right? It's about $80 a square foot, back in those days. So that's not going to work for a bunch of reasons. <clears throat> so we start to think about, what if, we, what if we combine those things together and we make a large prefabricated panel, 20 feet long, 40 feet long, that we can install in much bigger chunks. And this you do need the tower crane for. So it's really important that you get this in in a day because you don't have any more than a day or two of crane time a week because the crane's being used to put your structure in as well, right? <clears throat> so we have made a competition. We thought, okay, I think this is the way to go. I think it's going to work. And we got a few manufacturers interested in, in, in producing a panel. Um, we had somebody who was interested in doing it out of CLT. We had somebody interested in doing it out of steel studs. The steel stud people were, you know, the same people that put our drywall and the steel studs on our buildings uh, after they're clad. Uh, and we had a precast company say, we could do this in precast, no problem. Lightweight precast. So we thought, okay, first thing is, uh, we'll do a proof of concept. So we had done a proof of concept of the structure to prove that all the connections worked and to prove the CNCing was going to work and that everything fit. We thought, well, we got this and we may as well clad it. So we hired all three companies to put a few panels up here. And we said, it's really important. We're not going to do any water testing on these panels, but it's important that you can get them up fast. I mean, you got to show that you can put these things up in a couple hours. And, uh, and so we had all three companies come out. All three of them did really great, um, but separate on the schedule. The schedule on all three took, it took days to put these things up. Um, but they were working out the bugs, right? In a brand new system they'd never done before. <coughs> At any rate, the winner from a schedule, from a capacity, and from a, a budget uh, perspective was the, the company that, that was using steel studs. So they were using a, a hybrid steel stud HSS combo um, with an exterior insulated rain screen assembly on the outside. Looks something like this. Steel studs. Dense glass. We used a silicone membrane, so very breathable um, silicone, very watertight integrated with all the silicone other caulkings and elements that we used on the building. Uh, returns, right? Windows were pre-installed in the factory. We actually pretty got pretty low quality windows, but because they were very simple and because they were installed in a factory, they worked pretty well. Um, we needed to use a, a clip, a thermal clip, to make the R value work with the insulation that we, you know, could use. Roxel insulation. And a metal panel. At first it was a metal panel, it ended up going Trespa with a wood finish to make it look kind of wood green, um, which, I, which I quite like. Those go in, and really the only thing you do on site is caulk them together. So there's, on the outside there's a metal flashing to act as a baffle, and on the inside there's a one, two, three strip at the top, just like you'd put on, in, a, in a curtain wall stack joint. Uh, panels go in place, and <clears throat> from the inside you just caulk that. Right? Got to figure out how, how you're going to get that air water barrier past your slab, so you got to leave a little bit out so that you can run it past the slab. Uh, otherwise, you can't seal it across the slab edge. This worked pretty well, right? And they've got really basic connections. Like normally, we would use a curtain wall stack joint here, but because we're you know, trying to make something from nothing, uh, and this particular manufacturer was, was really based, you know, it was really a steel stud manufacturer. We used little HSS sections in a, in a slot to create the 
you know, to allow the vertical movement, but also take the wind and, and dead loads. All right, so that's it. And then from the inside, uh, basically finish it. Uh, so it worked pretty well. Here is the real proof of concept. Now this is our PMU test. So once we get to the point where we've designed a system and we've got all the bugs kind of worked out, we make a set of shop drawings for a, a, the most complicated part of the building. In this case, it's a corner with a, with a window in it. <clears throat> and then we, you know, this was, we, I call this a, a 4D mock-up because the timing was the most important thing. And I think, uh, Graham, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was about 20 minutes to build this mock-up. You're watching it here. It was under an hour to get this thing done and waterproof, which if, if you've ever done one of these with curtain wall or window wall, it's roughly a week to make one, get it installed, and get it ready for testing. We were ready for testing in an hour. We let the caulking dry and tested the next day. <clears throat> right? We use, uh, um, you know, we run that through all of the curtain wall tests, you know, the dynamic water tests. The, we racked it, you know, three inches each way, tested it again, made sure it was working, made sure we had the air leakage right. Uh, worked a few little bugs out of the system, you know, um, especially at the corner where we racked it. Uh, but we got it to work, and we got the schedule to work, so we knew we were onto something. This is uh, the manufacturer's plant down on Anasis Island, and it's, a, it's an old railway terminal, so he can bring things in uh, on the railway and then uh, build them out here. So really, really a low-tech shop. There's no, not a, you know, no, no CNC machines. There's no milling machines. Nothing. Just a bunch of guys with sawzalls. These screwdrivers, so and a welder. So really simple, you know, to, to make these panels. <clears throat> and this is what the building looked like before we started. And here are the panels going in. So we got those in, we got those made, we met our client's budget, and we met the client's schedule, which were the two things that I think, you know, I thought were, were pipe dreams. Um, this is it all, all installed, and this is it looking pretty good at the end. For that kind of price, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, once you build it, because you're building a system you've never done before, with a contractor that's never done it before, um, lots of field testing, commissioning, air tightness testing. This is the very first, um, you know, I commission air tightness starting day one. So here's where we're doing some smoke testing, and, you know, that's not looking too good in case you're confused about how much smoke should come out when you do a smoke test. That's way too much. And what we found is that here, at this, at this stack joint where this HSS comes up, it was too hard to caulk behind there, uh, so they didn't. So they left a big chunk out of the caulking at that vertical stack joint um, twice, or two or three times on every panel. So I said to my guys that were testing, let's just test it, we'll show these guys what happens when you leave the caulking out, because it's always a good feedback loop for the installers to know what happens if you don't do it right. Well, the installers are, are there watching, we test it, doesn't leak. Right? There's enough, there's enough um, overlap between the systems and enough baffling that water never gets back to that hole. Even though there's air leaking through it, no water came in. So they were all jumping around going, great, we don't need to seal it anymore. And I was like, no, you still need to seal it. You can't not seal it, guys. But yeah, if we don't seal it, it's not going to leak. That's good news. It won't pass an air test. So this is a shot here of one panel coming in. This is a 20-footer, and then uh, there's a larger 40-footers down on the other side of the building on the longer side. And so here's a time lapse of the building getting built. It's going to slow down here at, uh, I think, floor eight and talk about, yeah. So facade and enclosure, 22 pounds per floor, 374 total, eight hours of installation time per floor. That's unheard of. I, you know, if it was an Olympics of building enclosure, we would have won gold this year because that's the fastest I've ever seen a cladding go on in, in my career. So really good way to do it. This is another building, and then again, this is the other archetype. So that was a tall wood building, no scaffolding, no access from the ground. That's the way you have to do those. It's clear to me that's the way to do it in the Northwest where we have rain and other things. <clears throat> we talk about other ways to do it. This is a smaller building. It's got lots more, lots more cladding and it's all closer to the ground. You can, you can bring to the table other solutions, right? On this particular one, um, you know, wood structure. Uh, again, the CL, this is a CLT prefabricated cladding, and it's hung off the floor slab, but in this case, we're spanning two floors. Make the panels a little bigger, get some better economies of scale. I find for a tall wood building, you're better to span only one floor, but for a building like this, where it's, it's not as tall, uh, makes, makes sense to maybe grab two floors. 
right? Uh, vapor permeable membrane, insulation with Z-Gertz. And in this case, uh, the cladding is a terracotta. So that's something that really doesn't match well with stacking them up and shipping them to site and hauling it up. So, so in this particular case, um, the work for the cladding and the window insulation was done on site. So we prefabbed the CLT, protected it from moisture, put it up, and then off of these lifts, um, we put the windows in and, and put the terracotta cladding on. All right, <clears throat> so there it is going up. All right, this is ready for cladding. And there's cladding going on. This is a terracotta cladding going on here. Uh, and these joints sealed with silicone from the exterior. So again, just got to make that call. And it's somewhere around four stories where it starts making less sense to, to get on the outside and put cladding on and more sense to get it all done. But then you do have to balance what you're using as a cladding. So if it's something that's, that's like terracotta, which is fairly fragile, um, that may not be the best cladding for panelizing and throwing up on a high-rise building where a wind might catch a panel and smack it against the building, right? <clears throat> These are both valid methods of, of making this work. You just have to know where to deploy them. Another one is people come to me all the time. I got this really cool um, single family home. It's super complicated. Um, there's not a single joint that's 90 degrees. You know, every panel is going to be different. I want to prefab it. It's like, no, can't prefab that. The key with prefab is to try and get only a few panels and make that economy of scale large. So if you can, if you can get your panel number down below 10 with different panels, that's when you can start thinking about prefabbing. You're going to make 10 of each panel that's, uh, and you're not going to have any more than 10 panels. You can go, okay, that makes sense. But if you don't have a 90 degree corner in the building and you want to prefab it, it better be a large building and you better have a lot of cash because that's where you start to need those CNC machines and, and much more accurate fabrication facility like you might see in a unitized curtain wall system. So you're probably going to be smaller panels in a completely different kind of factory. Um, could still be done, but it's going to be nowhere near that $50 a square foot. As a matter of fact, you can't do that anymore anyways because the cost of things have just gone up since we did that building. <clears throat> so here's where we think we're headed. And we've, we've got proof of concepts. We've got mock-ups made. Uh, we just have to build a building like this now, and we're, we're well on the way to do that. So I think we're going to call it curtain wood, right? Unitized curtain wood, um, where we take what we know about unitized curtain wall technology, and instead of using aluminum as mullions, we use CLT. Right? And we fasten those like unitized curtain wall modules on a building, um, you know, using proper stack joints and things like that. This is the, this is the way of the future. We know this, this kind of assembly method works for unitized curtain wall. It's what we build most of our buildings with, you know, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and if we want to bring wood up to that same level where we're using it on a regular basis, this is the way that I think it's going to end up. Um, and this is a little mock-up if you're in, well, right now this is residing in Vancouver, but if you're in our Vancouver office or you want to see this down here, we can chuck it down, but it all comes apart and you can build your own unitized curtain wall sample. Uh, but this is the way to go. So if you, let's say we have prefabricated passive house CLT wall panels, right? The, the plethora of everything. We're going to throw everything we want at something and, and see if we can make that work of a precast panel, and now we've had that precast panel in some kind of membrane, and now we're just talking about Brock Commons, but integrating some better technology with respect to how we join the panels together, right? Um, we've got a stack joint or a chicken head that we, we use in the, in the industry uh, between panels horizontally, right? Um, and other than that, it's very similar to Brock, right? And then vertically, we have a choice. We could put uh, cock joints there, we could use uh, uh, a silicone gasket, you know, and then all it is on site is a, so, you know, an extruded silicone sheet cocked in place at the joints. And then here's a cock joint, right, from the inside. Uh, that's one way to do it. Another way we're doing it is, uh, is a, a silicone gasket in a receiver on both, on both panels that fit together. Very much like if, if you're familiar with the Shuko curtain wall system, very similar to that. Right? Super simple, works great, looks great, and it's going to be cost-effective, affordable, schedule-driven, the works. <clears throat> now the next step, right? Uh, this works uh, great if you don't have any balconies, <laughs> which we didn't on Brock, uh, but you're going to have on your buildings, right? 
so this works great, no balconies, no problem. Add a balcony, uh, we start to wonder how we're going to do that, right? What's the best way to put a balcony in? And this is something we're working on now. So this is a, the same panel system, right? Roughly the same panel idea, but now that, that stack joint is going to be at the underside of the slab so that we can install adapters onto this that are anchored to the building so we can either bring in balconies after the panels are installed. So you put the panels up, building's done, and you slide your balcony in and attach it. That's one way, right? That works for passive house and these higher level uh, thermal um, targets that we're looking for. Um, or the balcony comes right on the panel, right? Um, I've seen this, in, uh, I've never seen this in the Pacific Northwest, um, but I've visited projects in China where when the curtain wall comes, it comes with a balcony on it and the handrails and the glass in the handrails and you pop it in, just like unitized curtain wall. And the sliding door, all in one, in one panel. We can do this on this kind of panel. So we can have a low threshold door pre-installed with a balcony sticking in it. Um, so this is the next step. This is the next iteration we're taking on our next few projects, which steadily become more and more complicated as we, yeah, we can do this. Great, we want to do this. This is even more complicated. Uh, and that's where we're headed right now. So look for that in the near future, where we actually integrate uh, thermally broken balconies into this system and have them come either pre-installed or installed later. So future of tall wood facades, they've got to be erected at the same pace as a structural system. So you saw in that Brock Commons video, you're erecting the structure, and right below the structure, you're erecting your cladding, right? And that way, you don't need to worry too much about water coming in sideways. You really only have to worry about it coming in through the, the part of the building that you're building, um, you know, each floor slab. <clears throat> There's growing market opportunities. You're going to see all kinds of hybrids. You know, here we have a, you know, we're talking about a, a CLT, aluminum, steel, probably fiberglass window hybrid, right? Combine everything we have in one. Fiberglass clips, you've got every possible uh, building material into that, into that system. Um, and really inspired by the precast industry and the, and the unitized curtain wall industry as sort of us taking ideas from that industry and, and making uh, wood frame, wood clad buildings out of it. And this building here you're seeing here is the latest one that Graham and I are working on. It's your trifecta. It's prefab, it's passive house, and it's mass timber. Um, so it's going to be a real, a real interesting one. And you can see there's balconies on it and there's a lot of complexity. So we're, we're basically throwing everything we've got at this one. It'll be interesting to see how it pans out. It'll be fun. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Yeah.